All right. Next up, we have Aditya Siram. Hopefully, I got that all right. Uh, he's better known as Deech online. And uh, he's going to be talking to us about his GUI programming framework. All right. Cool. Can uh, everybody hear me? Is the mic on? Yes. Cool. Awesome. So this is uh, you know, a binding to the FLTK uh, GUI toolkit. And it's a binding in Haskell. And the idea is to allow you to write uh, native GUIs in Haskell. Um, to those of you who are not in the Haskell community, uh, it might surprise you to know that, that this is as yet an unsolved problem for some reason. Uh, this, is just, <laughs> this is just one more approach. I'm not saying I solved it. There's certainly problems here. But there's some reasons why you might want to use it. So FLTK itself is, uh, you know, it stands for Fast Light Toolkit. It was written in C++ for embedded systems. Um, and because it was written for embedded systems, the C++ is relatively clean. Like, there's no multiple inheritance, there's no exceptions, there's no templates. So it's all made so it, like, you can jam it into like a very small binary. And that's, actually, and that's a really nice thing, feature to have when you you know, are trying to just write a light GUI of some sort. Uh, it's been around for 15, 20 years, I think, at this point, And it installs cleanly on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Caveat, it blew up somebody's Mac yesterday. Uh, so I'm working on that, but I will fix that, <laughs> figure out why that's going on. And w another really nice thing about it is it comes with like an old style GUI builder. Like if you remember back in the VB6 days, forget the language, remember the GUI builder. Um, you know, you could just drag and drop widgets. And for just throwing up a, a, a demo, like who really wants to deal with like positioning widgets and things like that, it just makes no sense. So for that, um, there's a GUI builder and the uh, the Haskell implementation uh, has complete integration with that GUI builder. So basically, you drag and drop widgets, and it produces Haskell code. And I'll show you more about that in a second. So you can write native GUIs in pure Haskell. It's not pure. It's all in I.O., but you're writing in Haskell. Um, so, whoops. It installs easily, except for the fact that it blew up on a user's Mac yesterday, which I will also fix. I got a Mac and Cloud account last night. Um, and it installs easily in Windows, and I do have uh, positive proof of that. Uh, uh, contributors said, yes, it does work. Uh, it has very few dependencies. The library has six de seven dependencies, not including base. That's, and those six, byte string, directory, file path, MTL, parsec, and C2HS, are standard Haskell libraries that install easily. So this, I, I understand that Cabal Hell doesn't exist anymore because of stack, but if it did exist, it, this wouldn't contribute to it at this point. Um, and it also produces zero dependency binaries on Windows as well. And I'm going to make the claim that it's easy to learn. Now, everybody says this about their library and their API or language, but I'm going to qualify that because it's hard to learn in some ways, but it's easy to learn in the ways that I think make it easy to learn. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and also, uh, a, a, a feature of the API, which I'm not going to cover in this talk because I'm not going to have time, is that you can add a third-party widget to this without recompiling. So if you find some FLTK widget in the wild and you decide you want it to like, you know, write a binding for it and use it as part, of your, uh, as part of your application, you can do that without breaking apart this package. It just, they just both, both exist side by side. If you have a pr proprietary widget that you don't want to like, expose, again, it just works. And that is something that I don't think that the existing um, GUI binding toolkit things uh, in Haskell provide you at this point. So what is this easy that everybody keeps talking about? Uh, so in my case, I define easy as being, being able to reuse all existing documentation for FLTK. That means that if I go on the FLTK website and I look up the C++ um, documentation with the member functions and all that, there's a predictable way of getting from that function to the Haskell function. There's predictable naming. The parameters are as much the same as possible. If you Google some problem that you have with the API, and you will because the API is not perfect, the, neither FLTK nor the binding is going to be perfect, you Google something, you find a Stack Overflow answer that has a C++ answer, a Stack Overflow thing that has a C++ answer, very easy to backport that to Haskell, right? Because it looks almost exactly the same. What is not easy is this is definitely not a pure functional layer. Like, this is not going to be a functional reactive programming layer, anything like that. This is very much mutate -y. Uh So please bear that in mind. Um, 
So easy equals being able to reuse ex existing documentation. Not easy is pure functional Haskell. So widget names. So if I had a widget called fl underscore widget that translates to ref widget. Ref is just an abstraction for a pointer of some sort. So ref widget means I'm pointing to an instance of widget. Um, fl light button translates to ref light button. I've removed the uh, fl prefix and I've remo removed the underscores. Widget construction is similarly easy. If you were going new space fl widget in C++, you would just go new widget in Haskell and you would get back a ref to a widget. If you were going new fl light button in C++, you would just get back new light button in Haskell. I've tried to keep the function names the same as much as possible. So there's a widget called evaluator that takes a minimum and a maximum. It's sort of a parent widget for things like dials and sliders that have a minimum value and a maximum value. And there's a, fun a member function called bounds that takes the minimum and the maximum. It's called bounds in C++. It's called bounds in, in Haskell. Um, Haskell, I mean, Haskell doesn't have instance, arrow, member functions, so it's bounds space, a reference to that instance and the two arguments. Almost exactly the same. Getters and setters are unfortunately a little bit different because on the C++ side, function overloading is used for getters and setters. So if you want to set something, so fl evaluator has a member function called value, to set it, you give it an argument. To get something from it, you just don't give it an argument, and it has a return value. Haskell doesn't have overloaded functions, so I'm going get value and set value there. It's a little bit of difference. But the coolest thing I think about the API, and I think what makes it easy to learn, as I say, is that all FLTKHS methods have emulate multiple dispatch. So what that means is, well, okay, so there's an example uh, widget in, um, on the C++ side called FL input, and what that means is it's, a, it's just a widget that takes some kind of input and displays it in a text box, right? Either a password field or a text field or something like that. And it too has a member function called value. It takes a string and the, you know, how many of that string you want to write out to that text field. In Haskell, you can just think about that as a function that takes a reference to an input, a string, and it may be end because that integer could be null. But we just saw previously that um, set value was taking a reference to a evaluator and just taking a double at that point, right? So what's going on is that there's some type level magic going on where the rest of the arguments depend on the first argument, as you might expect when dealing with an object-oriented toolkit. I'll get into that magic a little bit later. There's a cost to be paid for that, um, unfortunately. But the error messages are not too bad. Uh, so if I have set value and I give it an input and I don't give it the arguments, uh, GHC will just come back as though it was a regular function and say, hey, you forgot to give me a string and it may be int. It gets slightly less nice if I don't give it a reference to anything. Uh, at this point, GHC will come back and say, hey, I need a reference to something. I'm going to output something called impl, but I don't know what that is until you give me the reference because everything after, uh, everything after the first argument is based on the first argument. The worst error message, unfortunately, is when you try and call a member function on a uh, object that doesn't support it. So for instance, the table widget doesn't have a value function, uh, and unfortunately you get this sort of, the underlying type level implementation leaks through. Um, not really too much I can do about that. I tried to get rid of this in some nice way I couldn't. Uh, so, but the information's all there if you squint at it correctly. The first thing is saying no function, and the second thing is kind of giving you the name of the function, but that's with a capital S as opposed to a lowercase s. Sorry, that was the best I could do. I'm hoping that GHC8's uh, custom type errors will allow me to give you a better error message uh, down the road. But for now, this is what I have. So, as I... Whoop. As I said, the real type signatures are ugly from the point of view of users, right? You don't want to see that stuff. So all of the, um, the Haddock documentation for each widget has a listing of all of the functions that it supports with the nice synthetic error message, right? Uh, nice synthetic type signature, I'm sorry, excuse me. And it's all clickable. So if you go, if you like click on, um, you know, a widget in, on the hackage page or something like that, it'll show you everything that it supports. and it's, and it's like, say you didn't know what that maybe shortcut key sequence is, you can just click that, and as though it was a, a real function, it would take you to the, um, the definition of that data type. 
Additionally, um, all of the widgets have their hierarchy, a little diagram of their hierarchy on all of their haddock pages. So there's a, a widget called value input that uh, its parent is valuator and the parent of that is widget. All of that is clickable and all of the parent's functions are also transparently available without casting or anything like that. And also, I have a demo package that has about 18 demos end to end, and 16 of them are exact copies of what comes with, of what ships with FLTK. So the idea is you put them side by side, and because the APIs are, are so similar, you can learn the Haskell side of things, but just by looking at the C++. So here's an example. Uh, this is a browser, a uh, browser widget, and it's called a browser because it was probably made before browsers were a thing. And, <laughs> and all it does is display some text of some sort, right? So what we're gonna do is concentrate on the bottom right-hand corner here, uh, where there's this like, little choice menu that shows you what kind of selection you wanna do on this browser. Do you wanna be able to select multiple lines at a time, just a single line at a time, yada, yada, yada. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the callback code for that uh, widget in both Haskell and C++. And don't worry about the details. Um, just note sort of the high level correspondence between the code, just sort of the, you know, the way that things match. So here's the C++ code. Uh, there's a for loop up top doing something, and the rest of it is just some kind of switch statement-y looking thing. Uh, it's matching on a string and then doing something else, right? So just note that for now. Here's the Haskell side of things. Uh, up top, there's a for loopish looking thing courtesy of control.monad. And uh, down below that, you have a sort of, it's, a, it's just a case statement that's, uh, that's, uh, that's selecting on some string and doing something. Looking a little closer, the for loop in C++ is iterating over all of the lines of the browser, taking away focus and leaving focus on the first line. The for loop in Haskell is doing exactly the same thing. Notice I've tried to leave the comments as is. So if there was a comment on the C++ side, the same comment is preserved in the Haskell side just to sort of give you a visual indicator of where you are. So really this is, the, the demos aren't made to show you what idiomatic Haskell looks like. The demos are made to show you as much of the API as possible so that you can put them together and learn how to use it. Oh, and uh, the uh, string matching is exactly the same. Uh, there's some kind of switch case looking thing in the C++. In Haskell, it's just pattern matching on whatever the choice the user made and setting the type of the browser to that. Oops. And you get call stacks. Um, for non-Haskell users, call stacks are another unsolved problem. Um, just FYI, uh, which is why I mention it. Um, so it supports it out of the box in 7.10x. If you're using something previous to 7.10x, uh, you'll want to compile with profiling turned on or something like that. And all instance functions check for a null reference and throw a call stack, uh, throw an error with a call stack if they, don't, you know, if they find a null reference. So here, for instance, is a very simple uh, UI that adds a button to a window, and the first time you click that button, it deletes itself. And then it tries to get a label out of that button. So at that point, the button's a null pointer. And you get this call stack. The bottom right there is telling you where that call was made, um, you know, and what line, source, file, this, things like that. Uh, this seems like a little thing, but if you're a non-Haskell, I mean, <laughs> if you're a Haskell user, for me at least, it was super nice to have that, especially since when you cross runtimes, all you get is a seg fault. Uh, you don't even, you can't, you can't get the, the C++ call stack. It's just not possible. And there's a skeleton project to help you get started because there's some non-trivial GHC options I have to pass um, in order to get static linking to work correctly. Uh, so there's a skeleton project. It's just a very simple Hello World app waiting for you to fill it in with your, with your app. Um, and so some of that hairy stuff is taken care of for you. So I mentioned Fluid. Uh, it's a fairly mature GUI builder. It ships with FLTK and there's out-of-the-box integration with FLTKHS. You don't have to do anything to the tool, it just works uh, with FLTKHS at this point. It's designed to generate C++. So what it does is it takes sort of a GUI specification, you drag and drop widgets, it generates some kind of intermediate format, and then the tool takes that and generates C++. All I've done is, uh, with the FLTKHS package, I've shipped an executable called FLTKHS, Fluid to HS, which takes that same interface, interface specification and outputs Haskell. And the whole thing gets sort of munged together. 
and to help you get started with that, oh, and there's a bunch of examples, um, FLTKHS fluid examples also on Hackage. To help you get started with that, there's a skeleton project, uh, FLTKHS fluid hello world. And this is what it does. Wait, for that. So all there is in that fluid world package is three files, a file with the callbacks, a main function, and the fluid file. You run Cabal install on it, and you get an executable out, right? So something's going on that makes all that work together. You don't have to do anything more than just run Cabal install. And here it is, all it is, window, hello world, you click it, it says goodbye world. And if you clicked it again, it would say hello world, that's all this thing does, okay. So, all right, simple. But if you open up the, um, the fluid file in the fluid tool, you get this little tree looking UI. It's, it's, it's pretty retro, it's, uh, it looks a lot like Glade or anything like that, it's not that much different. Uh, so there's this import callbacks, which I'll talk about in a second. By the way, before I get started on this, please note that I'm reusing a tool designed to generate C++ to generate Haskell. So please bear in mind that a lot of the places where you just kind of stick text are not where you would think they would be. But this is the best I could do, short of rewriting the tool to generate Haskell from the get-go, which was kind of out of scope at the time. Or, and still is, I think. <laughs> um, so, all right, here we go. So if you double click the window, it opens up the GUI and you get a widget bin, you can drag and drop things if you want to and make it, and it, they'll just show up underneath there. Uh, if you double click on the properties for window, it gives you a name and under the, and that name, that is the Haskell variable name, if you will, of that window. So imagine all of this stuff goes in one big do block. So imagine there's a window new and on the left side of that arrow, it's going to say main underscore window. Uh, okay, don't worry about what the void star thing, all of this stuff is kind of ignored. Uh, Again, because I'm reusing a C++ tool, sorry, best I could do. <laughs> if you double click the button, it's also got a name, but it's got a callback field where you can wedge in the name of a callback, and it's called button CB, right? And here's the callback, it's sitting in a module called callbacks, and all it does is take that button, look at the label, if it's hello world, turns it, turns it into goodbye world and vice versa. So how does it know to look there? Well, it's in this import callbacks thing up at the top, and <laughs> I've reused a dialog box for setting top level static properties in C++ to set imports. <laughs> That's, I couldn't do anything. <laughs> and there it is. So you can add more of these down there. You can add qualified imports, whatever. So yeah, not intuitive. Uh, that thing that says static in source file, don't, don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> And you have a main module uh, that runs that main window function, gets a window, shows it, and then kicks off the event loop. So how does it know that make window returns a window? Well, if you double click that function, it's expecting a C, fun a C++ function, which is name, open parentheses, arguments, right? Well, if I put a colon colon in there, the tool complains. So I've just kind of reused everything inside of those parentheses to be the Haskell type signature. So <laughs> this is make underscore window, and then take out the parentheses, go colon, colon, IO ref window, right? That's what it translates to. Yep, don't worry about that global and C declaration thing over there. This is, yeah, but it works, it works. It <laughs> <laughs> and then at the bottom, you have to return the main window, right? And C++ gives you this thing where you can stick arbitrary code uh, into like the tool, and I'm just reusing that for, for Haskell code. So, the, 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 the way this all works together is in my setup.hs, I've uh, overloaded, I've added to the hooked preprocessors uh, record, which is a thing that says, okay, if you see a file like CHS, use the C2HS tool, or you know, HSC, use the HSC to HS tool, or whatever. I just added it to say, if you see a file that's .fl, use that executable that I shipped with FLTK, right? And so that's why when you do cabal install, uh, hello world.fl just gets turned into a module called hello world.hs, and the whole thing just compiles together. So bottom line, that guy gets turned into an interface specification that looks like that. By the way, <laughs> like I think this was written at a time when tickle was still a big thing, right? So if you, if you look at this, this looks a whole lot like tickle code, uh, and I think that's pretty much why it is the way it is. So I. I have a parser that takes that and turns it into that. And 
compiles it and runs it. So that's that's fluid, and it, it, it I have almost 100% integration. There's only one widget that doesn't work, and it's kind of a sort of an inconsequential widget. It's the help viewer. Don't worry about that. <laughs> no, it just lets you. It's just it just gives you sort of like a little about window in your in your application. You know, that's, that's all it does. And you can do fairly complex things. I laid this all out in Fluid. Actually, no. I'll, I didn't lay this all out in Fluid. One of the nice things it does is if you have an existing C++ Fluid, um, um, uh, a Fluid application, you can directly import that uh, into Haskell. Like, you have to, of course, if there's arbitrary C++ co code in there, you have to change it, and you have to rewire the callbacks because it's not going to translate arbitrary C++ into Haskell. It's out of scope for this project. <laughs> right? Uh, but all of the layout stuff works out of the box exactly the same. Uh, so this is the most complicated uh, demo out there. It is not a good UI, but it is a complicated UI. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that's for the purposes of the demo that makes it a good UI, right? Because <laughs> you want to show the complication. And so there's about 180 widgets on that, on that screen. Uh, just I, I know that because I had to write callbacks for every one of them. Uh, okay. Uh, so that's that's fluid. You can also add dir functions directly to fluid. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip past this. Here's another one that you, I just laid out in fluid. Uh, complete copy of what comes with C++. But uh, yeah, I can add functions. Don't worry about that safe cast thing there for a second. And all and it just all works. All the functions just get thrown into like that Haskell module, and they just work. Oh, and by the way, uh, one last thing. If you add arbitrary code, unfortunately, you have to add it using um, uh, the curly brace semicolon version of do notation, uh, because the thing doesn't really respect indenting very well. So um, you have to do that. Sorry. So in any case, here's the bad. Here's why you may not want to use FLTKHS. Like I said, uh, I'm going to talk about the good and the bad. Uh, the compile times currently aren't great. This 180 widget screen takes 11 to 15 seconds to compile uh, and link. Uh, on the REPL, it takes about nine seconds uh, to compile and link. And, the, and this is actually way better than it used to be. And the way I got here is a sorted tale, which I will now share with you. OK, so this whole thing started off when I was looking at WX Haskell. And WX Haskell has an incredibly elegant model, in my opinion, for multiple dispatch. So what they have is, Say you have like some bottom object, right? Like everything is an object, right? So you have like a data type called object, and it's just a wrapper around a pointer. So an object is a wrapper around a pointer to some instance, uh, instance object on the C++ side. If you wanted a child of that object, like a widget, you create a fresh data type called C widget and a type synonym called widget, stuffing that C widget inside of the object. So if you expand out that type synonym, it's object, and a pointer to a C widget of type A, right? So if you now wanted to subclass a widget with a window, you create a fresh data type called C window and stuff it inside widget. And if you expand out window, it's object, pointer, widget, window of type A. And the A right there, you can think of it as just a hole to keep filling in like, um, like how, how, you know, however much you want. And so what this means is, say you had a function called print that took something of type widget and outputted something of type IO. OK, expand that out. It's object, pointer, C widget, A, right? It also accepts a window because window is just object, pointer, C widget, window. But this function doesn't really care about anything that comes after C widget, right? So you get something subclassy looking here. And it works. It works pretty well. Uh, it's extensible without recompiling. A third-party package can just add their own my window, no problem. No type classes. This may even be Haskell 98. I don't know if it is or not, but it may. That's awesome. I kind of went all in on this when I first started. I'm like, this is super elegant. But as I kept going, I realized that I couldn't, like changing arities just didn't work. So like that value function, that set value that took different arguments, whether it was a evaluator or an input from before, I would have a special case for that. Input set value, valuator set value. OK, so that's a little incons inconsistency in the API. But I'm like, oh my god, I can maintain backwards, compatibi back backwards compatibility all the way to like Haskell 
one or something, and <laughs> I can just do this. So I just I kept going. Compile times are great, but as I kept going with it, I found more and more and more inconsistent method calls to the point where mid 2014, I could not stand my own API. It sucked. <laughs> like I I couldn't stand my own. I couldn't dog food my own code, and then depression followed, and. Because I was like, I can't release this, this sucks. And I'd like, I had like, I don't know, thousands of lines of this stuff, like in my, yeah, anyway. Um, so I just walked away. Uh, and uh, because I was depressed that I couldn't support older versions of, of GHC, uh, which some of you probably think is a bad idea anyway. But anyway, I had that in my mind. Walked away in November, turned to H-less. I'm like, okay, I can't support all the old versions of GHC, but Oleg did this in 2004. So I can at least support it back to 2004. That's not too bad. I can do that. Okay, cool. <laughs> so in HLIS, you have, um, it's pretty much the same scheme. Uh, instead of like having object take something of parameter A, it takes a nothing, like a, you know, an, an empty, uh, empty set of parentheses. And the same thing, like you have an object, takes an empty set of parentheses. If I want to stuff a widget, I stick, I stick a widget in front this time. And if I want a window on top of that widget, I stick a window in front of the widget. So if you expand out window, it's C window, C widget, C object going to nothing. It's just flipped from before where it was object, widget, window, right? So I have an H list, right? An heterogeneous list. Yes, this doesn't use type level operators, but it's my own little world and I can do that. But this is an H list. And for each function, I also have an H list. So uh, create a data type for function set value, create a data type for function print. I have a type class that maps a widget to an H list of functions. So I have an instance of functions of widget going to set value and print. That's saying that my widget uh, object supports set value and print. And an instance of functions going from window to set value and print saying that window also supports set value and print. And I have a third type class called impl that marries up a, a function name, a widget name, to an implementation. So I have impl that takes set value and widget. And in the case of widget, it's string going to IO. In the case of window, it's int int going to IO. So this is how I get my multiple dispatch. And then I have a function that delegates everything. A set value function that takes a ref of type A and runs some type level check on that, uh, I mean, you know, like runs that through the type level thing that like searches through the hierarchy looking for that function and returns an impl and that's what it, give, that's what it gives back. Uh, find function also searches down the hierarchy, which is how you get transparent access to the parent class also. It's essentially what's there right now. It goes all in on type class prologue Oleg style 2004, because that's the version I was trying to support. Maybe a little later than that. But that's essentially what's there. It gives me multiple dispatch, but unfortunately, it litters my code base with orphan instances. Like, each of these impl guys here are orphan instances because they all appear in their own module. Uh, didn't really know what to do about that, but at this point, like, all like, pretense of elegance was just gone. I was like, <laughs> okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> it's a little more complicated than me, you know? Okay, it was also a huge transition. I did this between mid-December and mid-January of 2014. For those of you keeping count, that's about 18,000 deletions in the code base and about 6,000 additions. It absolutely sucked. <laughs> like, like, I still remember um, New Year's Day, 2015, early in the morning, still bleary-eyed from playing like knife knuckle with like the GHC compiler all night. It's <laughs> And, and this is how bad I have Stockholm Syndrome. After I was done with this, I'm like, oh my god, I could not have made this migration if it wasn't for the type checker. Like, <laughs> it was only like a couple days later, I'm like, yeah, the type checker caused the problem in the first place, you know? <laughs> but <laughs> static typing is pretty sweet Kool-Aid. What can I tell you? I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, by the way, one consequence of this, I had to up the context stack because if you're pulling type class prologue and your H list goes beyond a certain number of elements, it blows out the context stack. So I was like, okay, screw it. I'll just add that too because no more elegance. It doesn't matter. It's just one more thing. 
Okay, but we'll just call this smooth sailing from now on. Like I've redefined, like I've been playing like elegance limbo here. And like smooth sailing from now on, good. And then a few months later, this behemoth hit. This 180 widget screen. Compiling and linking took between 12 and 15 minutes. From begin, I couldn't believe it. Like I really could, I, after two minutes, I like control C and I'm like, what is going on? There's gotta be something. I turned off my computer, turned it back on, turned off all of my services, every single one, and restarted the compilation and just kept going. I was like, you've gotta be kidding me. And like, I just sat there and 15 minutes later, the thing finally popped out and executable. I'm like, I had already released this and <laughs> I'm like, nobody's gonna wanna wait 15 minutes to see that friggin' tree. Like, <laughs> This sucks. This absolutely sucks. And okay, depression set in again. I had no idea what to, what to do. Okay, so a, a few weeks later, in the fetal position, I, uh, I ran cabal build minus v3 with a stopwatch because there's no such thing as a type level profiler. I have, once the thing starts type checking, I have no idea what it's doing, unfortunately. So. Half the time was spent in this thing called the simplifier phase. I still have no clue what the simplifier phase does. All I did was go on the GHC website and hope to God there was a flag with the word simplifier in it, like <laughs> in the switches. And then I just set it to zero, because <laughs> I think that means just don't do that thing, right? <laughs> Okay, so it went down from like 12 minutes to five minutes. I'm like, nobody's gonna wanna wait five minutes to see a friggin' tree. Okay, so it went from squat to squat and a half. This is, <laughs> this is not progress. Okay, depression. Okay, and then a few weeks later, I upgraded to closed type families. I'm like, okay, can't support back to 2004. Now I can only support back to GHC 7.8, which is when closed type families were first introduced. No more upping of the call stack, context stack. Somehow that fixed it, I don't know why. And compilation went down to 15 seconds. For some reason, type class prolog makes it 15 minutes. Closed type families, which is almost a drop-in replacement, makes it 15 seconds. I don't know why that is. If there's GHC does in the audience, maybe you can explain this to me. Still, and it takes nine to 10 seconds to load up in the REPL. Uh, that's, it's okay. It's still not great. Um, it's really not the kind of like, it's, it's not the fast feedback loop I would want when I'm doing like UI type stuff. But there it is. That's the best I could do as of today. Um, I'm hoping that once we get overloaded record fields, all this stuff just gets tossed and I get back on the happy path again. For now, this is what I've had to do. Um, okay. So to wrap up, I'm gonna wrap up relatively quickly here. Why do you want to use it? Because you just kind of get uh, like no fuss, native executables, just throw some together once the Mac issues are fixed. Um, and you can reuse intuition that you already have from like OO programming, not saying that callback style GUIs are the way to go. I don't think they're great, but we know what they are and you can reuse, like there's a plenty of support for it on the internet, just Google things and you can literally just take that code and mentally transpile it to Haskell code. Why wouldn't you not want to use it? It's definitely retro looking as like the nice way of putting it, somebody yesterday called it grody and <laughs> And I can't really argue with that, unfortunately. Uh, and that is unlikely to change. Uh, because it is an embedded toolkit, uh, they don't support theming. They do support theming, but it's all baked in. So like, you can't like th have a separate theme file that like you just kind of throw it in with and you get a separate theme. There's like four themes. They all look equally retro, unfortunately. But it's zippy, it's pretty fast. Um, so. If, if you're okay with that, then you're okay with this. If you're not okay with that, you probably want something else like HSQML for now or something like that. Also, compile times are not great, like I just said, um, but I'm hoping that this is very likely to change. I'm hoping that either there's somebody in the audience right now who can sort of give me the magic GHC thing or tell me how to work this, or once uh, overloaded record fields become a thing that is well supported and bug free, that this will just take care of itself. But either way, it's here now, uh, and I'll take any questions.
Yeah, I think he was first. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so uh, you've got these overloaded um, multiple arity functions. Yeah. Uh, is the type signature after you pass the initial ref? Yeah. Is that uh, uniquely determined by the the type of the ref you pass? Yes. Um, have you tried using functional dependencies? Yes. And it doesn't it doesn't change no. it. No. Ah, too bad. Because, so the the whole problem is if I could have just laid a, laid the whole thing out as sort of an ADT that's known at compile time, that would be good. But I also have this um, uh, requirement that it be extensible. Like right, so when you when that gets thrown into the mix, I don't know how to make it work anymore. Mm. Okay. <laughs> uh, so you were asking about GHC developers may be able to explain the performance stuff. I can't. I don't know if that should worry you or not. But what I do want to know is, uh, you know, did you submit bugs about this? Because I find the closed type family one particularly interesting. It'd be interesting to sort of. Uh, so what I did was. Uh, at, at, at the time when I was curled up in the fetal position, I submitted something to the mailing list that was just sort of a short little help, you know, type thing. But then somebody immediately came back and said, can you give me a sort of a reproducible case? And I was, at that point, I was like, I'm not going to, you know, make up an artificial, like, object hierarchy just to show you that this thing doesn't run right. I didn't feel right about going, hey, download my package and run it and please tell me what's going on because my code sucked. Um, so... Short answer is I submitted, I asked for help on the mailing list and on IRC, and but I did not submit a bug report because I didn't even know if I was doing something wrong. Right. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, it'd still be interesting to look at. And second, thank you for actually putting like such a nice thought into the design because I've tried to use like QT libraries in Haskell before, and I think every single operation has like its own overloaded type class and all this kind of nonsense. So yeah. I actually, from what I caught, I really like the way you designed it. Oh, so. thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, you mentioned that during the Great Migration, you deleted eighteen thousand lines and that added about six thousand. Did you have you considered using Template Haskell to try and do some of that work for you? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I ended up using Emacs macros, but <laughs> 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 like uh, the reason I didn't uh, throw Template Haskell in there because that's just one more dependency. And if you remember, I was really trying to keep the number of dependencies low. Um, so Template Haskell is, I think, a relatively heavy dependency at this point. So I just um, wanted to make sure I understood what you said about using Emacs macros. So is a lot of the, like at this point, like is a lot of the code done by code generation? So when you decide to no. add something? Oh, no. It's oh, I mean, I, I, it's completely ad hoc. Like I used Emacs macros where I could, uh, okay. but it was not nearly enough of that 18,000 to, you know, okay. to not make it not suck. Uh, <laughs> So a lot of this was unfortunately done by hand. Um, but it's done. <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. You were talking about using WX Haskell before, but that's a whole separate widget toolkit, right? So did yeah, you... so I, I looked at the WX Haskell design um, for inspiration because I'm like, I can't be the first one to, to, uh, okay. to want to do this. And in fact, I, look at, I looked at a lot of um, uh, literature before doing what I was doing. Uh, I, I believe I saw somebody here named Andre Peng yesterday, uh, whom I've never met before, but whose paper I read because he wrote a paper on how to bind to object-oriented toolkits. Uh, it had uh, a lot of the things I was looking for, uh, except for extensibility. You have to know the complete hierarchy ahead of time. Um, so, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Go ahead. Just curious, do you have a personal need for this GUI toolkit, or you just do it because? I had a personal need when I started. <laughs> and then this became the overarching primary target uh, for no other reason than, basically the only reason I kept going with this was a willful ignorance of the sunk cost fallacy. Like, ser <laughs> like, by all measures of how open source is supposed to work, I should have abandoned this a long time ago, but I didn't, only because it just, I mean, Every single week, like, okay, maybe not every single week, but at least twice a month, somebody on the Haskell Reddit asks for some kind of GUI solution. And it's always something like, you know what, just wait for, like, GHCJS or something like that. And I'm like, you know, like, the Haskell ecology, if it's going to be mature, it needs at least one okay, like, I think, native GUI desktop app type solution, even if desktop apps aren't, aren't in fashion anymore. 
Uh, I'm not saying that this is that, but I'm saying this is tending towards something that works, and maybe somebody else will come along and make something bigger that also works that's nicer. Um, hoping for a small subset of use cases, this would be the thing to use. Okay, thank you.